Welcome everybody to Flat Earth Nation. It is a Flat Earth Nation. Don't let them tell you anything else unless they are willing to debate you in a fair and honest way. The majority of this show today is going to be about the history of the fax machine, pentagraph, pentatelegraph. It's a copy of uh, the ink it used, the quality that it could use. This was the first fax sent in 1862. Over 10 miles, I think, 8 miles. Picture of uh, children reading a faxed newspaper in the 1930s. But before we get to that, I have some things I want to, that aren't really a part of a long message that I want to just pass on. How many times, how many people were called apostle in the New Testament? It's a very specific word. It's only used for apostle or apostles. It's number 652, 652 in your Greek Strong's Concordance. How many people were called apostles? Well, there were 21 men called apostles. Two of them are unnamed. Timothy was called an apostle. Silas was called an apostle. Epaphroditus was called an apostle. Junius was called an apostle. Andronicus, Barnabas, Paul, the Apostle Paul, and the Twelve. There's your 21. There's, those are the ones that I could find. So I wanted to pass that on because I didn't know where to go with it. And I didn't want to waste all the research I did on it. You know how that goes. So here we got the children reading a fax newspaper. I'm saying it was... 1862 and the ink was blue this is the first commercial what they could call a fax machine and this is it the picture of it as it became uh, in commercial use in the 1860s you know right around the time of the American Civil War Want to make a point of the thousand years, the 999 year leases that I mentioned on November 12th. Point, not embarrass myself and come back and say, because this is too important. Did you know that the Doomsday Book and when they were leasing them and building those cities, the star forts, they had 999 year leaseholds ought to be included in the returns because they were saying that, hey, some people that, you know, were grandfathered in and saying they'll always be the nobles. And that's one of the things that I want you to notice when you. I want you to notice that. Go back here to the beginning. I'm going to be going fast. I'm not going to be trying to. This is a wall, you know, corner, Nehemiah, Ezra 1 talks about it. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord may, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Then he made a proclamation throughout all his nation. And what, One way to tell a difference between the uh, before the time of Christ they all had the cities, the ancient archaeological sites that had the big saunas, steam rooms. And they were required to go there and sweat for a half hour a day if they were, if they were free men. Because that's how you get your largest organ in your body, your epidermis, your skin, purified of toxins. And you need to be purified from toxins if you're going to be a free man helping your city. And it, it also... From the beginning, when uh, circumcision was stated, you know, there really would be no way of knowing if someone was a Jew or not, because nobody goes, people don't go around showing their junk. But if you were in a steam house and you were free and you had to, then it would be obvious, oh, you're a Jew, you believe this religiously. So it, it had to come from things like that. Now, I want to this uh return of landowners only a few seconds many many people the phds that have convinced me 
and we'll convince you if you study them that uh, cosmologically our dating is all messed up you know our history is screwed up they've added a thousand years and i finally found the proof of the thousand years that started lasted a thousand years now this is so important so important i want you to just really give this a chance in five minutes if you're not still interested click off and thumb it down but the return of owners land the return of owners of land 1873 I'm going to be showing that what they called 1066 was the last known previous who had the land. Whose land was it? That's where we're going here. Years. And it's only a thousand years. Have you ever heard of the return of owners of land, 1873? The return of owners of land, 1873, presents the first complete picture of the distribution of landed property in the British Isles since the original Domesday book, dating from 1086. That's the 1086. Okay. So that's an interesting start, but it's not what I wanted to go over with, with these, you know, today's topic is going to be about the fax machine and uh but you know it does fit in with the thousand years and how they are releasing technology just like in the book i wrote the televised revolution it's it's released through certain people that are connected to geneva switzerland and uh the jesuits big time they're the people that are the ones that get it released out to the people and then cover it up when they have to. So we're going to start with first off working uh, in reverse towards the fax machine, just letting you know what the photograph was an early clockwork image receiving device similar in function to fax machines. It took signals from the loudspeaker socket of a radio receiver and used the electrochemical process to darken areas of sensitized paper wrapped on a rotating drum. Invented by Otho Fulton, the system was used briefly in the late 1920s to broadcast images to home by radio. No wonder everybody was happy with the radio. The machines themselves were expensive and required a good receiver to operate. BBC broadcast photograph images in 759 programs. The photograph was the subject of an article in the British Redcom Amateur Radio magazine in October 2007. So that's when they released that. What's this one? The wire photo. Western Union transmitted its first half-tone photograph in 1921. AT&T followed in 1924, and RCA sent a radio photo in 1926. The Associated Press began its wire photo service in 1935 and held the trademark on the term AP wire photo until 2004. The first AP photo sent by wire depicted the crash of a small plane in New York's Ariondack Mountains. So wirelessly, wirelessly. Technologically and commercially, the wire photo was the successor to Ernest A. Hummel's teledograph in 1895, which had transmitted electrically scanned shellac on foil originals over a dedicated circuit containing the New York Herald and the Chicago Times, the St. Louis Republic, the New York Herald, the Philadelphia Inquirer, in 1895, doing it wirelessly. Come on. Come on, man. In 1913, right before the end of the Golden Age, Edward Boulin, Balen, Balenograph, which scanned using a photo cell and transmitted over ordinary foreign lines, formed the basis for the A. TNT wire photo service. In Europe, services similar to a wire photo were called Balino. So what do we know about in between the wars? And who's been trying to tell you 
we don't know what's going on. During the U.S. leaflet dropping campaign aimed towards the then Empire of Japan near the end of World War II, Honolulu would transmit some radio photo images to Saipan, depicting proposed leaflet messages for the printing press on Saipan to produce. And how much did they cover this up? And they just started releasing it about 10 years ago, right around the time of the quantitative, quantitative easing 2, just like Queen Elizabeth II, QE2. You know, they Ponzi schemed and got everybody to believe that the property and land would never go down. That's a big deal. That is a big, big deal because you know and I know we haven't recovered from that. We never will. Right now, they're scrambling to solidify their positions. And we're going to be left holding the bag. It's only been 10, 11 years. And it, it, we're still looking to the government. And they had the, all types of plans to save you. What's this? The Courier 1B, the world's first active repeater communication satellite, was successfully launched October 4th, 1960 at 1.50 p.m. from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The first Courier satellite in Project Courier, Project 1A, was lost two and a half minutes after liftoff on August 18th, 1960. The reason I'm showing you that is because in that two and a half minutes, we'll see later that it did transmit a fax from the mainland to Puerto Rico using this thing. You know, it wasn't in orbit. It says after completing its first orbit, a teletype message to the United Nations General Assembly from United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower was sent to the U.S. Secretary of State Christian Herter to be delivered to Herter by Herter to Frederick H. Boland, President of the General Assembly at the United Nations, then in session, by coincidence, in New York. Eisenhower's message was transmitted by Courier 1B from Camp Evans to Deal Test Site. The message was relayed to Camp Salinas Training Area, a ground station and tracking installation in Salinas, Puerto Rico. If Courier 1B was in sight of two ground stations at the same time, Courier 1B had the capability of real-time messaging. Okay, so how new is everything? When could they do all these things? When did they say? We're going to be looking at, you know, just for your own information, what's an Earth battery? It will be coming up in just a second. The Earth battery is a pair of electrodes made of two dissimilar metals such as iron and copper, which are buried in the soil or immersed in the sea. Each battery acts as water-activated batteries, and if the plates are sufficiently far enough apart, they can tap telluric currents. Each battery has sometimes referred to as a telluric power source and telluric generators. It's what these batteries are called. Oh, Alexander Bain, 1841. One of the earliest examples of an earth battery was by this man who we're going to go into detail studying soon. In, in order to drive a prime mover. A device that transforms the flow or changes in pressure of a fluid into mechanical energy. Bain buried plates of zinc and copper in the ground about one meter apart and used the resulting voltage of about one volt to operate a clock. Carl Friedrich Gauss, who had researched Earth's magnetic field, and Carl August von Steinhill, who built one of the first electric clocks and developed the idea of an earth return, or ground return, had previously investigated such devices. He got this patent. Isn't that neat? 1841. Got an electric battery. You know, you don't need to spend a lot of time on it. How about that? Who's this guy? Father Giovanni Caselli was an Italian physicist, inventor, and priest. He is the inventor of the 
Pentelegraph, Universal Telegraph, also called the All Purpose Telegraph, the predecessor of the modern fax machine, the world's first practical operating facsimile machine fax system put into use was by Caselli. Wow. Born in 1815. In the beginning of his career, he was studying literature, history, science, and religion. Caselli was appointed a member of Dilatarno Italia. Besides his interest in science and physics, he studied to become a Catholic priest in the Jesuit order. And then he got ordained in 1836, but he was still working on science. In 1841, he went to Parma in the province of Modena to become a tutor for the sons of Count Marquis Santavella Modena. Wow, he was involved in those riots in 1849 and voted for the annexation. Kingdom of Sardinia, everything was rocking, but what about this thing? You saw a picture of that. Get an idea of how big it is. A tool that copies words and drawings, plus telegraph, an electromechanical system that sends messages through a wire over long distances. While Caselli was teaching physics at the University of Florence, he devoted much of his research in the technologies of telegraphic transmission of images as well as simple words. Alexander Bain and Frederick Bakewell were also working on this technology. And, you know, it did have problems. It was, you know, brand new. Caselli developed an electrochemical technology with a synchronizing apparatus, a regulating clock, to make sending and receiving mechanisms work together that was far superior to any technology Bain or Bakewell had. They were all sharing. Leopold, yuck. And they had these prototypes in 1856. That's how they could communicate all around the world when they were, you know, raping Africa, South America, North America. The genocide that ensued from the 1840s to this day. Caselli made a prototype of his system in 1856 and presented it to Leopold the Butcher II, Grand Duke of Tuscany, in a demonstration. The Duke was so impressed with Caselli's device that for a while he financed his experiments. When the Duke's enthusiasm waned, Caselli moved to Paris to introduce his invention to Napoleon III. Napoleon immediately became an enthusiastic admirer of the technology. Between 1857 and the start of the American Civil War, Caselli developed out of his Pentelegraph, also known as the Autotelegraph, in Paris under the guidance of French inventor and mechanical engineer Leon Foucault. Well, we know that Foucault pendulum. And we also, what, what, what do you know about 1861? Wasn't that the one year where for nine months we were using the Pony Express in the United States? While in France, they were using fax machines? In 1858, Caselli's improved version was demonstrated by French physicist André Bakul at the Academy of Science in Paris. Napoleon saw a demonstration of the Pentelegraph in 1860 and placed an order for the service within the French National Telegraph Network that started the next year. Though so That's getting it done. Caselli had access to not only the French telegraph lines for his fax machines, but finances were provided by the king, the emperor. A test was done successfully between Paris and Amiens with the signature of the composer, Giocassino Rosselli, as the image sent and received a distance of 140 kilometers. That would be this... That's still just one for the ordering the ink. This is the first one that was sent that 140 kilometers. Right here. So later in life. Let's look, let's take a look at this pen telegraph. 
It was an early facsimile machine transmitting over normal telegraph lines. Well, we didn't know that, did we? Quick stop. Message. Meet at bus stop. 130. And here's a picture of where I want to meet you. No, we didn't get that part, did we? The pen telegraph used a regulating clock with a pendulum, which made and broke the current for magnetizing its regulators and ensured that the transmitter scanning stylus and receiver's writing stylus remained in step. To, to provide a time basis, a large pendulum was used weighing 18 pounds, 6 foot 7 inches high. Two messages were written with insulating ink on two fixed metal plates. One plate was scanned as the pendulum moved to the right and the other as the pendulum moved to the left so that the two messages could be, trans could be transmitted per cycle. The receiving apparatus produced the transmitted image by means of paper impregnated with potassium ferrocyanide, which darkened when an electric current passed through it from the synchronized stylus. In operation, the pentelegraph was relatively slow. A sheet of paper with about 25 handwritten, wor handwritten words took 108, the magic number in sacred geometry, seconds to transmit. They got it working at the University of Flores. These people were all using fax machines and things like that in the golden age of Christ. Who is Alexander Bain? Don't in him, I be smirching him by saying he probably was in the Jesuits. Well, he was a Scottish engineer who invented and was first to invent and patent the electric clock. He installed the railway telegraph lines between Edinburgh and Glasgow. One night when he was bored, that's what he did. Now, segue. You see, what I want to do is that this one guy, when I was telling him how in some comments that Nicholas Tesla worked in a patent office, you know, and it wasn't that a coincidence that, you know, some of our great inventors often worked in the patent office before they became great inventors, like Edison or some, whoever it was. And a guy wrote me back and said, you're confused. It was Edison that worked in the patent office, not Tesla. There's a lot of patent offices. There's a lot of patent offices out there, okay? It's not just the United States, guys. He was his father was a crofter. He had a twin sister. Well, let's get to what he wanted to do. Where, where's he's got these clocks? Where's the history of this guy? So he got this clock. This is the one that was with the battery clock. The earth clock. This this was an electric clock just plugged into the ground. Earth battery. Good job, man. It was 1841, you know. Right around the time of uh, the Alamo and that stuff. Right about the time when uh, the Inquisition, the Jesuit order was brought, brought back into existence after being banned in the late 1700s. I think it was 1841 or 1842 that the Jesuits were allowed back in. So anyway, he got the experimental fax machine going, you know, you know, this was too burdensome in 1850, this space age looking machine. So they, they tried a chemical telegraph next, you know, that's some pretty, pretty advanced stuff. Now where, where, did it, where did I miss it? You guys probably already read it. Where did they get it? I know this guy was a Jesuit. Well, anyway, I proved it to myself earlier some other way. Maybe it's over here. So we're finally at the fax machine. Wire transmission. Scottish inventor Alexander Bain worked on it. Started sending faxes and, you know, crude ones in 1846. You know, it was the golden age. It was nothing like what we talked about. Or they, they, they taught us in school with the cowboys, you know, and build the forts out of, you know, sticks, sharpen the ends. And come on. Telegraphs. There's the teleautograph by Alicia Gray. Further development. Radio facts. I want to get to one part here. Uh, the radio cars. Because you got the idea now. Oh, those cars. How about this one? 
Xerox, boy, that was a big company. Came out of nowhere, started working with Lockheed. We're not, we, we, you know, they're not telling us what's going on. They're telling us, you know, like, oh, the first digital photo was in uh, 1970. Pretty small stuff right there. Okay. I want to, I'm going to keep going, but I wanted, I do want you to know that the, uh, Western Union, they used to have them in their cars in between uh, the worlds, the World War One and World War Two. They used to have uh, cars. Oh, gone it. I knew you would have found that interesting because they had wireless and wireless. But I think I've proved it already. I, let's see. I had these open for a reason. Oh, I wanted to show you. How did they find all of these statues and things like this? This is uh, was just released by the Archives of the United States of uh, 1918, 1919. Just after they, they went into Paris and said, oh, you can go, you can go clean up Paris now. Uh, the world, the Great War is over. And you can see here's the statues that you know you still go see and in, in uh, just let's look at this. This is a silent video. I made a comment, but that's how they did it. Just get your shovel and unbury it. That's hey, what's underneath here? Oh, it's a statue. Well, keep digging, guys. We'll let's see what it is. So they, they uh, uncovered it in 1918, 1919. Started, I mean, uh, doesn't look, you know, uh, so this this is original silent video from uh, right at the end of the golden age when these people, and it's playing at 1.25 uh, speed in case he looks like it's going a little bit faster. But now these are the released uh, movies to say, oh, they're just touring it looking at war trophies. This is the town they captured, and they're trying to act like everything's normal. But you can still see that in between the wars, they still had those buildings to work with, the infrastructure, just not as many people. But the cars and the horses worked together, and the streets weren't all filled with poop, and everybody still had a job to do. It's just that a great amount of the population died of the Spanish flu and in the wars and all the, the genocides that continued. My, I still think this is our best bet for when Satan was loosed. So uh, he's trying to look casual. Hey, let's talk and, you know, stop and chat. Isn't Paris nice? Yeah. It was the golden age. They're, those buildings are still the antediluvian they leased them for a thousand years. Jump ahead a little bit more. Just, just released yesterday, these videos were from the U.S. archives. So it might be two days by the time you see it. But there's nobody there, just officers and their wives going around. Yeah, this is what we found. This is the parish we captured. Uh, These are their war trophies in downtown that they're all looking at. Look, they got a guy coming out looking like a German, but he's a black guy. So they're just wandering around looking like this is how they found Paris. And they said, okay, so this is what you have to work with. Yes, these were the weapons that they were using. Okay, so let's, re let's engineer them. They show the planes, you know, everybody pose and happy, smile on crew. You know, these are extras. You know, this is the city we found. We're liberated. They don't know what's going on. Everybody's walking around going, okay, this is our new town. Yeah, these are the weapons that they fought the Great War with. These are the planes. Notice they didn't, uh, they didn't 
didn't hide the drafts and everything else of how advanced of a culture it was. They didn't do that till after the Korean War, where it was just, oh no, everybody, you know, get your lunchbox and go to work, and uh, pretty soon everybody will have indoor plumbing in the United States. Get some electricity, black and white TVs. Your radios don't have fax speaker machines anymore, do they? So that's how they found Paris. There's your planes. They said, yeah, this is what they used. This is, they hang these under those Zeppelins, the balloons. All right. So that's interesting. Just released yesterday. This is a video that I downloaded to look at from X Heliocentric. And it, this is a Cincinnati panorama of 1848. Right around the time when the Bain and those guys were working on the telegraph, the fax, and the pentagraph. So it was a different era than they're telling us. Wrapping this up now, two tabs to go. Only thing I wanted you to understand is like, this is the 1700s, okay? In the late 1700s, there was a growing discontent with Spanish rule among the Chilos, which who began to assume active roles in the economy, especially in mining and agricultural things. Why? The Enlightenment, with its emphasis on reason, questioning of authority and tradition, and individualistic tendencies, also contributed to the Cerillo discontent. The Inquisition, the Jesuits, had not kept the writings of these revolutionaries, Ben Franklin, Voltaire, Machiavelli, Thomas Paine, John Locke, Rousseau, and others out of Spanish America. Their ideas were often discussed, and so they had to take care of it. Simon Bolivar. But what do you know about Bolivia in our common memories? Well, that's where Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid went. And it was all just nothing. And then uh, the more recent common memory is the lost city of Z. And uh, the people going, there can be no great towns in South America, especially in Bolivia. It's an undisturbed jungle. Well, the Inquisition knew it had people studying these things, and it was far from a backward country at all. What's this? The last one. Oh, okay. Well, that'll be a quick end. This is just some of the things, that, the history of broadband facts, that if you start clicking some of these ones, you're going to find out they are just slowly releasing the history the way I predicted they would in my book, The Televised Revolution. The most entertaining and action-packed novel written in the last 20 years. I've been doing some comments now. I want you guys to leave comments. So I can, you know, because I don't get a lot of time on the internet to answer them. You ever know about that? Giants of God and Magog. Hey, you know I hate to say goodbye because I got a little bit of time, but that time has passed us by. So I'm going to say amen, hallelujah, aho. Remind you, it's a flat earth nation. Remind you, I have your best interest at heart. We're getting it figured out. There was a golden age. We missed it. Jump on the post Armageddon bandwagon and that will make you very happy. Thank you for watching.